Welcome. I'm talking to Sigal Iris today. Uh, Sigal Iris, is she your director, screenwriter, actress, you name it, to do with movies, you're doing it. But you have a, you have a fascinating background. I, I believe you're Moroccan, Spanish, Jewish background. Am I correct in, in saying that? Yes, you're correct. Thanks for having me. Yes, I'm uh, of a Moroccan heritage, Moroccan Jewish heritage. Yeah, but you're living in Los Angeles at the moment, where, where, you're, where you're working as well. With yes. your company, High Water Ales, High Water Films. Uh, that's the name of the company, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I just want to talk to you today about some of your projects. Uh, last week, I saw a, a beautiful short film you did. It's called Watch, Watch Your Number. Um, what was the inspiration for you to do that movie, that, to that short film? Because it, uh, it's such... The topic, the Holocaust, it's it, it's harrowing, but it was said as such a touching and kind of there was a slight of humor in it as well uh, at the start. So, if you just talk us tell us a small bit on, about that particular uh, short film. So that short film is actually was born out of uh, a desire to tell a feature film about this subject. But at the time I didn't have the budget and the resources to tell the full story. So I decided to kind of create almost a proof of concept of what the full story is about. And so the full story really is that Yishai, the older man that you saw on the bench, who is the Holocaust survivor, was with his sister hidden hiding in a pit of burned bodies as the war was over. As you saw in the movie, his sister shot the two Nazis and they were able to escape and hide for three days in a pit of burned bodies. So the full story is that while the Americans and the Russians were coming and liberating the camps, an American, an African-American soldier was walking and he saw something flickering that she that was in the pit of burned body and he felt like there's somebody in there. And the other soldiers are saying, there's nobody in there, it stinks, let's move on, let's do this, that. But he had an instinct that somebody's hiding in there. So the full story is that he goes there and he finds that young lady, Carla, and her little brother, Yishai and he takes them out of the pit of burned body. And what she was holding is um, in when a boy or, or a girl do a bar or bat mitzvah, they receive a little gift. It's called the Torah pointer, a, a pointer that helps you read from the Bible. Okay. It's, it's uh, Aramaic or Hebrew and you have to point at it. So they call it a pointer. So in this story, she received a pointer from her grandfather that had inscription on it. And he, he told her, hold on to it because one day it may save your life. So there's a, an interesting yes. subject. So yeah. To the oh. idea that she was holding on to that and, and, the, and the black soldier saw something flickering. And because of that, he saves her and her little brother. And then he brings them to America. So now you have a story of not, you know, we all have seen Schindler's List and we've seen all the details of the Holocaust. So my goal was more to show how he saved Carla and Yishai. He brings them to America. And what was America like for Jews after the Second World War and for Black and for them together? And so when you see the old man at the park, Ishai, the whole the survivor, he is the little boy that was yeah, yeah. Story to an African-American boy. So really, all I could do in that short film is almost show you uh, pieces of what the feature film would look like. Is my goal would be that it would be from the perspective of Ishai, the little brother. And that we would go back and forth and see how everything was born. And so when he sees the boy at the park, there's a little bit of a feeling that comes back to him as he was saved by a black man in America. Yeah, yeah. 
black men. So it kind of brought something of a circle to him. So all you, so now you know a lot more details of, of, of for the short film that you've watched. With the short film, you only see the Holocaust survivor kind of forming an unlikely friendship with the African-American kid at a park, at a mundane situation, because the the kid is waiting for his mom. Yeah. Oh, well. So it was like, it, it was born out of a very mundane situation, but it was then developing into him sharing his story. Yeah, what I, what I loved about it is that at the start of the of the, the film when the boy the, the old man gives the boy the, the phone and to talk to his mother and he says well, I'm here with an old man with a, with a tattoo and a mother panics not knowing what what kind of man that could be and I think that's that's where I said what the bit of humor comes into that because I can really feel that the reaction of of the mother as well as, as being a parent so but I think it's 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 it's, it's a beautiful moving. I know it has won quite a few awards, and I think it should probably win a few more. But uh, and I just want to, that's, yeah, it's it's a fantastic piece of work. Now, uh, give I just want to go back a small bit, and um, this year we, when we had the screenwriter and the the actors uh, strikes. Now I know you you're both uh, as well. So, how much of an impact did that have on on, on your work? Uh, because uh, or did it did it have any impact? Yeah, so I luckily last January I shot a feature film that I wrote, directed, and produced titled Serial Beauty. So I shot it for 21 days in and around LA last January. And then about a month or so later, we started post-production. So you're allowed to do post-production even during strike what you're not allowed to do is for example if you needed the actors to do voiceover or adr or you, during a strike you're not allowed to do that you're also not allowed to create publicity for a project yeah in my situation it wasn't affecting me too much because i was still in the process of post-production which you know post-production is a very long and mm. involved of everything from editing, sound design, to special effect, to coloring. So it's a, you know, it's it's a, almost a four months process. For me, it was like four or five months um, process. So the only time you're not really, you're restricted is if you have a project that is ready and you wanna premiere it and you wanna publicize it during a strike, you can't do that. So, there's no audition, there's no publicity for a project. And of course, there's no, as a writer, you're not able to have um, a producer read your work. So you're not okay. able to send your projects to producers, production companies, studios. They would not be reading during a strike. Okay, so, so it's, it's, it's that's something. Uh, the, the normal, like the, the regular audience would, would not be aware of that bit because I, I know, I can understand, like you're not allowed to promote, but yeah, but that's that's interesting. And you, and you mentioned the film already, uh, Serial Beauty, and I, I understand it's about a, a serial killer. Uh, am I right in believing it is a serial killer killing beauty queens? Or is it, you, know, you probably not, you probably won't be able to say too much about it because you don't want to give away a plot, but what is the... the, the, yeah. the serial beauty is a story of a... Every Monday, a beautiful woman is found dead at a beautiful location. And there's no blood and there's no gun and there's very little clues on the female body, except that it's so beautiful and it's almost set as an exquisite tableau. So the LAPD, the LA detectives are, you know, uh, baffled because this is a very unusual case. Uh, there's no relationship between the victims. And so we have, that is like the setup of the movie, but we really have a detective uh, who had a painful breakup with his partner 
and she left Los Angeles to South Carolina and they kind of mysteriously lost a baby, which ties in later into the story. And the um, in, in victim number three, he decides to call her and see if she would agree to come back to LA and help with the investigation because it's kind of going nowhere. There's uh, too many questions and, too, and unanswered, uh, and it, it, there's no clues. So she kind of doesn't want to come back to LA, but the case is interesting. And she was a forensic psychologist and she was a criminal criminologist and she was really good at what she did. So she decided to come back to LA and join him. And together, she actually is the first one to find a clue. And the clue is leading to the idea that the killer is obsessed with the Lilith. And Lilith, if you you if you're a history person, and yeah, yeah, the Lilith is is a is a mythological character, but she's also really in the Bible. She she's Adam's first wife was yeah, yeah. Lilith, who was cast away from the from the garden. Now there's a lot of interesting subtext and interesting midrashim and explanation where. It wasn't a snake that entered the garden. It was the lily. Because if a snake is already crawling, why would God say, why would God punish the snake? Now you shall crawl and there'll be animosity between your offspring and her offspring. So there's a lot of mysterious and mysticism in that whole chapter, which it wasn't the snake. It was the lily. Yeah. The lily back to the garden. She talked with with uh, Eve, and she said to her, nothing's going to happen to you if you eat from this tree. I ate from that tree. And so there's another layer of it is that Lilith and Samuel and Adam and Eve together, the four of them were cast away from the garden. So really, uh, Cain and Abel are not brothers from the same parents. That's that's very interesting. That's that's an intriguing. Uh, well, uh, it, yeah, I've, see, I've heard and I've see, seen more and more uh, things coming out about Lila as well. I, I just even mentioned a thing in the um, in the, in the uh, series we watched uh, recently called uh, Lucifer. I think she was actually mentioned in, in in there as well. She actually is a character in it. So yeah, and that, that that's a fascinating uh, aspect uh, to uh, to all of it. So yeah. Um, uh, also, a very great, a very very good uh, Turkish TV series. I recommend for for everyone to watch. It was called Shamaran. And okay. They did, they did a fabulous job uh, visually telling the story of the Lilith. I think it was one of the best. I just seen it uh, two months ago, so I've never seen it before. But because I made the movie Serial Beauty, and people that know a little bit about the subject. They're, they'll be sending me a message. Oh, you should watch such and such. And I yeah. was like, wow, that's excellent. Different story than Serial Beauty, but very well, very well made. Yeah, yeah. And Serial Beauty, is it is it past post-production? Is it, is it, has it been released yet at the moment? Or is, is, uh, is... Right now, I'm speaking with several distributors, and I'm about to sign a deal with one of them. So probably the first official screening will be in Cannes as one of the distributors. There, there are film markets. The, yeah. the one that's um, happening was called the AFM. They wanted it to be at the AFM, but this year AFM was not very, um, um, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Not, not a very productive AFM. So some people said, wait till Cannes, you know, atmosphere wise, for in general for the film industry, the post strike and the war and all that. So the AFM was not really that productive. So um, I'm in between distributors right now, making a decision where what's the best home for serial beauty. So like you said, when you say you saw across the line. So at the time that you saw across the line, 2004, you said? Yeah, it was about two, around that time, yeah. It was with a different distributor. So movies have life journeys. So right now it's with a different distribution company across the line. So it's with Indie Rides and it's on Amazon, Roku, Tubi, 
on, on many platforms. Yeah. So Serial Beauty will be with a distributor. And once they go to their first market, which will be Can, they probably will update me and give me some options. What do you think of Amazon? What do you think of uh, Apple or the different platform that today to go to the theater, it's either the big, big budget movies go to the theater, or if you're an independent movie with a really nice marketing budget, you can also try to put your movie in the theater, but most likely the streaming platforms is where it will be. Yeah, and, and, it's, and it's quite popular at the moment as well. Everyone watches, most people I know have more, two or three uh, streaming platforms as well. I mean, I do. Um, no, I, I was reading up on you on, on IMDb, um, and I, I noticed it, you have also been, you've, you've acted also, also in the Santa Barbara, the, the soap. Is, 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 is that correct? Yes, I did a few um, episodes in that uh, soap opera. Yeah. yeah, it was. Uh, I, I, I saw a few episodes myself before. It was uh, again it's going back uh, to the Netherlands. Well, they had this time where they were piloting uh, American soaps. Santa Barbara was one of them, uh, and I, I liked it. But well, actually, in general, I don't really like soaps. But it just, I got into it. But I then moved to the bold and beautiful. Uh, so, but but yeah. Uh, so but it, it, it's it's. Uh, uh, I like the idea of the of the American soaps. Actually, it's a bit more glossy than what what you have here. It's always very gritty, always very dramatic. Uh, so th th that was that. And uh, I just want to. In Ireland, I don't know. There's yeah, we have in Ireland. The, 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 there's an Irish one called Fair City. It's about uh, Dublin, even though it's not Dublin is not actually mentioned in it, but it's it's about Dublin. Fair City. Uh, fair City. Yeah. And to be honest, it's the, <laughs> I, I'm not a great fan. Uh, but we we watched um, in Ireland. They watched the, the the British ones as well, like East Enders and Cornish Streets. Uh, they are big ones here. And there is a cup show, cup soap show called Red Rock, and that that's that comes out every couple of months. They they, they come out with with, with a few. Episodes and again, it's it's. Uh, after all, it's not great in general. Irish television is, is, isn't um, entertainment uh, television is, isn't great. They're very good at current affairs, and but in general, the, the budget is, isn't there. It's a small country; it's only about five pe million people living here, so it's this not a big budget. Having said that, though, there was one great show called Love Hate. It's like a gangster thing. Uh, bit like I don't know, like the Sopranos, which which was very good, but that was the only thing I I, I could say that was that was good in, in Irish TV, but uh, I I just want to uh, um, maybe I read it wrong, but it also said that you you had played the one episode of Star Trek. Is is that correct, or did I re read that wrong somewhere? It was uh, an odd scientist with uh, the weird eyebrows opposite Whoopi Waldgrove. Whoopi Wall. Whoopi Goldberg. I, just, I haven't had coffee. Um, <laughs> small, um, small part. Very yeah, small. I mean it's. I we... pursued acting career for very long, really for a few months, because at the time I, I didn't understand that uh, when you come to LA, they, there's a tendency to put you in a box. They can't really, mm -hmm. especially late 90s, they they were not open to you being a writer, director, actor. So at the time that agent really wanted to focus only on acting for me. And I kept insisting that I'm a writer and I have a very fruitful imagination and I'm a very productive writer. I write fast, I see stories. And he's like, you have to put that aside. That does not belong with the acting. So it was very difficult. I should have listened because these people know the industry much better than I do. I did. I do it. I know the industry now. I didn't know it then. And so it's a good, uh, it's a good idea to listen to people that know better than you. But at the same time, I was stubborn and I was like, no, I can write and I want to pursue the writing and the directing. And I don't understand why it has to be that way or the other. So he didn't agree with me. 
So looking back, he was probably right because he did have a nice lineup for things for me to pursue, and uh, and I booked um I booked three really good lead roles in movies that did not happen. So one was them opposite Willem Dafoe, but at the time I thought, well, you see how there's like you have no control over this. You can yeah. Do a big role and then the director has a big fight with the producer and then they never shoot the movie and writing felt uh, like it's very tangible i can control my story i can sit down and write my script and rewrite it and have feedback and send it to a professor and so to me there there's a great passion in writing yeah and that's more exciting for me than no, I like acting. I might get back to it more now, but writing and directing again, directing is a very, very hard job. Producing is a very, very hard job. Writing is different because you're in your office, in your element, or in a coffee shop, wherever. So it's a it's isolated, but it's also a more relaxed kind of journey. It's with you and your vision in your head directing you have to be social you have to know how to be around a lot of different personalities producing. yeah so i'm and, not uh, but I, I presume writing is also you can be more focused you, you can look at, at, the, at the one aspect of, of the whole uh, of the whole uh, process and of course if you're a storyteller which i believe you are writing is probably an easier outlet than than be acting, uh, be acting it. So, but and uh, like I said, I've, I've seen it across the line. Uh, I thought that was a great movie, and because uh, uh, I always check IMDb, I, I'm, I'm a I'm a numbers person, and when and I was surprised to get got very low rating. I, I was wondering why why that was because I had, I saw a similar thing with um, a documentary uh, as I watched years ago. Which is done by a lady called uh, Pearl Fernstein. It was called the, the last, the last laugh. It was it was about uh, about Holocaust as well. And only got six point something, where I thought it would have been a nine. Uh, so sometimes I, I don't understand where these ratings come from. But I, I enjoyed that movie. I thought it was very good. It was, it's a good kind of yeah, it's it's a good thriller. Uh, uh, but I had lots of layers to it as well, and, and and that comes out of me this interview as well. Like you, you like stories with layers in it, so we, and that that came out in that movie as well. So yeah, across the line, um, across the line has a a, a high uh, viewers viewing. Yeah. Like I, some the, the rating uh, sometimes it's three and a half stars, sometimes it's four, some, I don't know, it's like Amazon, I think it's three and a half or something, but yeah. you never know um, who are the critics who are watching it and you can't please everybody. You have to make a movie that you like, that you connect to the story or you have a reason to tell that story and you just do your best to make it entertaining and meaningful. Like, yeah. It takes time to make a movie so I wanted to always be about something and always uh, like you said humor like humor is so important in a story because in life things are funny and sad at the same time so yeah and we, we can see sad things uh, plenty enough especially nowadays as well so everyone's while you need a bit of a, a laugh as well so what what are your plans for for the future, uh, what, do you have any new projects lined up? Yes, I'm uh, pursuing a project called Ansar. It's a TV series, and it's a sci-fi. So as you can see, I'm very multi-genre. I don't have one genre that I stick to. Comes mm. to me. So uh, right now, I'm pursuing a uh, two TV series. Uh, one is a comedy called Falafel about a group of people that opened a falafel food truck here in okay. LA. And they were hoping to pursue their dreams, but it didn't go so well. So they ended up opening a falafel food truck and that's actually working out for them. And then the Ansar is the more serious, but more in, more interesting fact. I think UFO is a very interesting subject, right? 
it's always been fascinating for me. I think it's more popular to talk about now. There has been testimony in Congress uh, with military personnel that testified that uh, they for sure have seen flying objects that they know are not part of the US military. So when you put together everything that people have seen around the world, and these people are not connected with one another, you know that there's something there. And yeah. I wrote a series called Ansar. Ansar is uh, so it's sort of an Arabic word. And uh, it, the story will start in the Dead Sea. Um, okay. So it's, a, it's a very mysterious place by itself, Metsada and the Dead Sea. And so that's where the story will, I don't want to give too much away, but that's a, a very exciting project that I hope will, uh, will move along. Yeah, I thought I would hope that too, because that's something I I I'm, I mean I, I love sci-fi as well, and I, I agree with you with all you are voting. It's, it's intriguing, you know, whether they're there or not. But there's too many things um, happening where so where you can't really dismiss uh, that that there's no such thing, and and of course, well, I mean we're just a dust of a bit of speck of a dust on, in the whole universe, so. It, I think it should could be quite arrogant to think that this is the only place where there's a bit of life. So um, doesn't mean that there's other intelligent life anywhere else, but that there could be plants or whatever. So yeah, I think that's an intri intriguing um, thought as well. Like so, yeah, I, I hope it, it, it will it will work out. And actually, I, I wouldn't mind seeing the falafel as well. That sounds like a, a fun a fun thing as well. So. Well, thank you very much for for this interview, and I'm sure we'll talk again some stage when the new projects come out, or may, maybe even after uh, the serial beauty is, is, is released. Because I'm looking forward to see that. I saw the trailer; it looks it looks very interesting. Oh, did did I send you a trailer for serial beauty? It, it's on it's on your website. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, I was going to say, oh, I'm going to treat you for a trailer because there's about five different trailers. Well. <laughs> You can you can still send them because uh, uh, I mean uh, I'll watch anything. Yes, thank you so much for reaching out and having me. It was really nice talking to you, and I definitely want to come to Ireland. It's on my list for sure. Yeah, I mean it's it's a great place. Cold, but but great. <laughs> well, you dress up warm, but you guys, uh, it's so beautiful there. I I would love to shoot a movie there at some point. Well, actually, uh, Limerick, where I live, they, they, they have a, a quite a, a good studio here as well. It's uh, uh, called Troy. A Troy Studio is a Limerick. It's uh, it's uh, they uh, sh they shot High Flyers there, which was a Netflix series, and they've done a few bits and pieces here, and it's and it's picking up at the moment. So yeah, uh, for a filmmaker, Limerick would be a great place. Uh, in, in Ireland to to uh, to shoot a movie or shoot a project, so I can send you the information on that, on that if you want. Yeah, to, on, on, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Well, thanks for that. I will we'll, we'll talk yeah. soon. Thank you so much. Have a good rest of your night over there, right? Yeah. yeah thanks. And enjoy your afternoon there. <laughs> bye bye.